All right, welcome to Roar. I'm Charles, and we're live again as usual. Um, doing these live, mess up and mess up. If the Holy Spirit speaks through me, you can hear them both. So we're going to do them live every single time. Um, I'm excited today. We're still talking about the armor of God. And today we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. So before we get started, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, forgive us our sins. I ask you, grant us the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and revelation in your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, let's go back and read the beginning um, of the armor again. Uh, in Ephesians 3, I mean 6, uh, 13 through 18. It says, therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, which is what we talked about yesterday, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will which you will be able to uh, extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. With this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and uh, petition for all the saints. So this is what we're talking about yesterday. I'm going to show you this. This is what this is all about. This is why you take up the whole armor of God. So that you can pray and petition and pray at all times in the spirit with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. We have to be consistently in a state of prayer. Uh, and you have to be aware of your surroundings. That's what spiritual warfare is all about. You need to know how to pray effectively. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You need to know how, who to pray for, how to pray for them, when to cast out devils, when to rebuke the demon, when to rebuke the flesh, and when to fast and to pray, and, and what the difference is. So yesterday we talked about girding up your loins, which was, this is the typical, I'm going to show you, this is the typical outline of the armor of God. And they make reference to a Roman soldier's uh, outfit at the time, because this is when Paul wrote um, to Ephesus was he was in prison. So this was their typical outfit. This is an incorrect representation of the armor of God. As yesterday, we talked about the belt of truth. It actually meant it said gird your loins. Uh, and it was a six inch belt. And you took the backside of your dress or skirt or whatever. And you pulled it up around the front and you tucked it in. Uh, and you protected all of that area. So we went through that yesterday. You can go back and look at that one. Uh, but likewise, it had nothing to do with this little belt that this guy wore. Uh, and, and the symbolism is still the same. The Everything is connected to the belt. Uh, and your sword and the breastplate's all connected to the belt. Uh, the breastplate's connected by four corners. So today, this breastplate... In the Roman depiction, this is what you see a lot, right? I don't even know what this word is. Lorica segmentata. An iron or bronze breastplate was built in four sections to cover each shoulder and side of the chest. The plates uh, were sewn to a stiff leather vest, which is put on like, the, like a jacket before the front plate and were tied with leather straps. All right, so when I think of putting on the breastplate of righteousness, uh, you can't think in carnal, you know, carnal thoughts. You can't think of physical things like this. This is not, this is a physical battle. We're in a spiritual battle. So you don't put on iron. You know, God's not going to tell you to dress up in an old iron suit to go do battle and prayer. So I believe Paul is talking about something completely different. Um, in verse 28 and 15 of Exodus, if we go back, it says, you shall make a breast piece, breast piece of judgment or a breastplate of judgment. The high priest in the old tabernacle didn't wear a breastplate of made for war and combat. Their breastplate was a 10 by 10 plate with the 12 stones of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement once a year, and he would make a petition for all the saints. He would make a um, sacrifice for all the saints. And all that all that did was push back sin for a year. That didn't do away with sin. Jesus did away with sin for us. He made one sacrifice for all time. And when you are forgiven and you ask forgiveness and you repent, it's gone, washed away in the deepest of sea. So the priests in the old tabernacle, they had a, an outfit and different garments and different things they wore. Uh, and when they went in on the Day of Atonement, on that one day, they tied a rope around their leg in case they dropped dead in the presence of God, they could drag them out. So um, we don't have to do that anymore. He says, and we'll get to it in a minute, we can come boldly to the throne of grace in time of need. Uh, and that's the, ble- the breastplate of righteousness. We can walk, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what you are. If you're a Christian, you're a believer, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you can be confident and bold in that. It's not by anything you did. There's nothing you could do. You can't do good enough work. You can't be a good Christian. You can't be good enough. You can't be the best Christian. It's not a competition. It's a relationship. You know, my kids always say, and every one of them says the same thing, right? I got four of them. They all say, this one's the favor. You're the favor. I'm the favor. This, I love them all the same. That's what they don't get. We have different relationships with them at different times. They're all different ages, so they have different stages in life. And you get closer to some in certain areas, and other times they move on. You get closer to a different one. And it's a relationship, though. It's not a religion. Likewise, our fellowship with God is not a religion. It's a relationship. He made us to be sons and daughters, to fellowship with us. He's not interested in religious activities. He could care less. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. He says, your religion is like filthy rags. He told him, he says, he actually rebuked him and said, you have your father, the devil, the father of lies. He said, the whores and the prostitutes and the drunkards will get in before you do. We're, God made us to fellowship with him. So it's all about relationship. You're still a Christian. I'm still a Christian. Some of us have in our different walks in life, whether you're a baby Christian or 20 years from now, you're mature and grown in the ministry and your fellowship with the Lord is different. It's not better. You're just in a different place than you were 20 years ago or the person that you just witnessed to. But we're all still children of God and we're all still going to the same place. So rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and that one day we'll be in heaven with him again. It's going to be soon enough. I hope sooner than later. And I want to tell you, let me show you, uh, this was the Roman uh, armor that most people make reference to. Okay, the breastplate, it's not a bless, this is not a breastplate of righteousness. And I could be wrong. This is... This is my opinion, and I'm going to show you why, and I think it's justified through Scripture. But like I said, this is not uh, an absolute. If I'm wrong or you hear me say something and misquote something, I'm good with it. Call me out. Send me a note. Send me an email. Call me. Fuss at me and tell me, and I'll fix it. I'm good with it because there's only one absolute truth, and it's not my truth. It's the Word of God. So we want to know what that is no matter what it is. As long as it's true, I could care less what it is. I just want to know the truth. So the priestly garments look like this. And on his chest, he wore a breastplate of judgment. That's the Old Testament. There was a breastplate of judgment back then. Now, in the New Covenant, because of what Jesus Christ did for us, we can wear a breastplate of righteousness. So Paul was the most educated of all the apostles. He wrote two-thirds two thirds of the New Testament, um, and he suffered more than most, more than all of them. They were, most of them, all were martyrs except for John that we know of, um, and that's just through historical records and Fox's Book of Martyrs and things. You can go research that stuff out and see their history and to their end and what happened. Um, but Paul is very educated, spoke multiple languages and accepted in multiple cultures, You know, he was a Jew and a Roman, so he was accepted in both. Um, But he was in prison, and instead of referencing 
the Roman armor, I believe my opinion through his wisdom and understanding and knowledge of the word, he was referenced in the word of God. So Isaiah 59 uh, and 17, and Isaiah is prophesying of Jesus. And he's talking about Jesus when he said he, and in 17, he says, he put on the righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Paul was quoting the Old Testament. He wasn't talking about the Roman guard that held him captive and treated him like an animal. He was talking about the scriptures. He was talking about a breastplate of righteousness that took the place of the priest in the Old Testament. Things changed. The keys to death, hell, and the grave were taken away from Satan when Jesus rose. He gave those back to us and established a new covenant, a better covenant. We don't have to wait. We don't have to go to anybody else anymore. The Bible says only call, call only one man father, your father in heaven. We don't have to go to a priest and confess our sins. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says there's but one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. And that is Hebrews, just so you know, my wife said to make sure I show you the scriptures. So... Uh, you can come boldly to the throne of grace in time of need. And this is uh, Hebrews 4 and 16, NESB 95 version says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. In the King James Version, it says, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Either way, when you it's bowing your chest out, it's not walking in arrogance, not walking in self-righteousness, but you're walking in the righteousness of God and you're walking in confidence and pressing forward and confronting the enemy, when they are attacking you, you walk in the righteousness of God. You have a, a there's a story in the, I have to go back and find it. So tell my wife, I'm sorry, I didn't quote this scripture. Um, I'll find it for you. But uh, the king, uh, Solomon, I, think, I can't remember who it was, had taken over. I said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul? Um, forgive me if I misquote this, uh, the names, but I'll find it and tell you in the next video because we're going to do another one tomorrow. So he says, is there anyone left of, the house, left of the house of Saul that I might bless? And they went and found this crippled beggar that was broke. And he says, bring him up here. And he made reference to him being, the guy made reference to himself. He says, who am I? Like a dog begging at the table. And the king just ignored him. He says, go clean him up, put clothes on him, put rings on his fingers and sit him at the table. His place was at the table, not because of anything he did, but because of his father and the price he paid. That he paid. The righteous place that we have, that's what righteousness means, is right standing with God. You didn't earn it. You didn't pay the price. You pay the price over time that we all do. You have to die to self. You have to sacrifice to get to know him, to live in, in, to live with him, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It all comes with a price. But your righteousness, you didn't pay for. Jesus paid for that. And he paid for it for you. So you don't have to worry about, oh, am I worthy? Or I've been a bad Christian. It, forget all that. It's washed in the deepest of sea. Repent of it. There's no more condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And you stand up bold. You stand up confident. And you go to the throne of God and you pray and you talk to him as your father in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You have every right. You have every authority. And don't let the devil lie to you. He, God wants to know you. He wants to talk to you. And he doesn't just have to talk to you through a preacher or a teacher, or an evangelist, or somebody on TV, or your pastor. God can fellowship with you one-on-one. -on -one. You can go to him anytime you want. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 1 and 16, that this is what we are, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He says, but it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus but you are called to live holy. That's the dying to self. 
And it's a process, just like a marriage. The Bible says the two shall become one flesh. You're married. Day one, congratulations, husband and wife. <laughs> it's that painful process of becoming one over time and learning to die to yourself that the two become one. You ever looked at an older couple and you thought, man, they look a lot alike. They act a lot alike. They could be brother and sister. Well, that's kind of creepy, but they older couples do. They look a lot alike. They act alike because they've been around each other for so long and they finish each other's sentences. They, they interested in the same things. They do the same thing. One mind and one accord. If you go to tell on all one, you can't tell on one and say, don't tell mom or don't tell, tell me something and say, don't tell Angie. I tell her everything. I, I mean, there is no secrets here. I don't believe there should be. I don't believe in secrets. I don't think there should be. Now, I think you should call people out, say what it is, get to the root of it. You know, my daughter called me the other day about a particular issue. And Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. I say, it's hard, it's difficult, deal with it now. And she did. And she called me back with such a relief, a freedom. You know, the burden's gone and it's all over. Instead of waiting, you know, over time, that thing gets bigger and worse and hairier and stinkier. And then one day it's out of control. And now you got a real problem to deal with. And I've been through that too. That's a horrible way to deal with it. Deal with it up front, first and quick and foremost. So I had a dream. I'm going to finish with this. Um, it's about, about 25 years ago. It was when I first got born again. And I believe it was prophetic that one day I would preach the gospel. Um, and I didn't know any better. I didn't even know the word at the time. I had no, I was completely ignorant. But I knew God loved me and I knew I was born again. There's no question. I had a dream. I was walking on a road to a church. And I believe I was going to preach. You know how you catch something out of your peripheral vision? Um, I could see the ground moving. And it caught my eye. And I looked down and the ground was covered in snakes. They were just, you know, like that scene out of uh, Indiana Jones. You know, when he looks down in there and you see the floor is just covered in snakes. The whole floor was moving. And at first, I went to pick my foot up to try to get away from them. But then I realized they were very weak and lethargic. They couldn't even lift their heads up to bite me on the ankle. The Lord has put all things underfoot. All things are subject to us. The disciples came back and said, Lord, even the, the spirits are subject to us. They are. The spirits are subject to the saints. You do not have to fear the enemy. You fear the Lord. You don't fear the enemy. Everything is subject to us. And that is the, the breastplate of righteousness. We can walk in that authority. We can walk in that kingship. We can walk in what God, God called us to do, not by anything we've done. Your confidence is not in you. Your confidence is in Christ Jesus. In Revelation 5 and 10, it says, For you have made them to be a kingdom, and priest to our God, that they will reign on earth forever. He's talking about us. And just like in the old covenant, when the priest wore the breastplate with the 12 tribes of Israel and was able to go into the Holy of Holies and commune with the Father, Jesus has now made me and you priest unto God that we can come boldly to the throne of grace in time of need without any insecurities, without any doubt, without any unbelief in who we are in our place in the kingdom of God. So I want you to walk confidence in the Lord today. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, forgive us our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I ask you, bless us with the spirit of wisdom and knowledge as we learn and have the revelation of the breastplate of righteousness, that we learn to walk in it with confidence with boldness, and that we learn to fellowship with you every day. I'm Charles. This is Roar. See you tomorrow.